Hello everyone, uh, my name is Deepin Desai. I'm the CISO and Head of Security Research here at Zscaler. Today in my session, I will be walking you guys through uh, a very important stage of a modern targeted attack cycle, right? So let me spend a few minutes uh, walking you guys through what a targeted attack looks like. So the reason why a lot of these modern targeted attacks are successful is the adversary is able to start by discovering all the things that are visible to the external world, right? So the uh, legacy Castle and Mort uh, network security architecture means you have a lot of your assets that are exposed to the external side. Uh, and that is the first stage of the attack. The goal for the attacker over here is to find you. Anything that is exposed, they will look at even your social networking presence, identifying the employee names. And this provides a perfect uh, starting point on what all things can they attack to uh, achieve a compromise. The second stage is where they will uh, attempt to compromise that asset. Uh, and this is usually through spear phishing attacks, malware exploits, vulnerability exploits. The goal over there is to have one asset in your environment that they have established complete control of. And from this point onward, this next stage in the attack is where they attempt to move laterally. And if you have the legacy architecture, it's a relatively flat network. Uh, this, this is fairly trivial for them to then move around in your environment and uh, reach those high value assets where they're able to steal a lot of sensitive information. Now in the Zscaler world, uh, ZTNA makes sure that user to app segmentation and app to app micro segmentation are critical part of your overall architecture. And what that means is your users are not on the same network as the application, right? Uh, that's number one. Your applications are hidden behind Zscaler cloud. Uh, so the external attack surface goes away. And number three is, uh, the attacker is not able to uh, move laterally like you're seeing in this example. So the final stage in these attacks uh, usually ends up with them stealing sensitive information from uh, any of the assets that they've managed to compromise. And these are usually, you know, code bases, financial statements, anything that they can hold the organization accountable, right, to say in case of ransomware attacks, pay ransom. Now let me walk you guys through uh, what happens once your first asset is compromised. Right? There's a huge difference between an asset being compromised and your entire network uh, being taken over by the threat actor. And that's the third stage, which is where they're trying to move laterally. What we're gonna look at now is uh, we will double click on the lateral propagation stage. And there is a huge difference between an attacker able to compromise one of the asset in your environment versus your entire environment uh, being compromised. And that's where this stage plays a very important role. So we're gonna start with an environment where there is a compromised asset, uh, which is behind uh, Zscaler private access. That's what you see on the screen, um, right? And the uh, typical first step from that point onward is the attacker will try to recon the environment. What are the machines that are reachable? Um, they will also look at things inside the machine's memory, browsing history, things like that to identify those critical assets. Uh, and uh, depending on the uh, expertise of the threat actor involved, they may do something uh, more stealth uh, versus more aggressive. In this case, for the purpose of the demo, we will be doing a pretty short scan uh, for a very specific ports because my goal today is to perform a log 4J RCE exploit. And I want to identify all the web applications and potentially some developer systems as well that I'm able to reach uh, through this compromised asset. So I'm gonna hit scan over here. I'm just using a simple Nmap scan. Um, and this is the range that I was able to identify uh, from the system uh, based on some of the uh, SSH keys that I found. Uh, and um, here are the results, right? So I'm seeing three hosts that are up and I'm able to reach from this machine. And uh, I also see that there are uh, these th three ports that I was looking for. All of those are open on the system as well. 
Now, me as uh, the attacker at this stage uh, realizes that they have uh, identified three assets. The next stage usually is they will try to fingerprint those assets. They may even try to connect to those, right? And uh, this is where what really happened is Zscaler's active defense technology uh, is being uh, used by the organization uh, in this scenario. Uh, all those three systems that were tactically planted in the compromised endpoint right, as part of our deception deployment were decoys. Right? They are not real applications. And when the user attempted to uh, scan that, or even when they try to access that, uh, you know, your SOC team will see an alert. Uh, this is me switching to the admin panel of our active defense product, uh, Zscaler deception product. And your team will have detailed uh, information available, telemetry, event logs, uh, that can then be leveraged to orchestrate response. Right. We've rightly flagged this as lateral movement uh, attempt from a potentially compromised asset. So switching back to the compromised machine. Now at this stage, um, if I were to look at your SOC team side, your team has ability to restrict access for this compromised user so that you know, you're able to uh, do things like uh, step up auth, right? So uh, invoke multi-factor authentication. You are able to leverage Zscaler Cloud Browser Isolation, which I will uh, also talk about at the um, later half of the demo. And, and um, uh, your team can essentially block access to your internal application for this users uh, because of uh, the potential post-compromise activity. Now let's say there was a log 4J, um, uh, there was a web server inside the environment behind ZPA that the user has access to, right? And this is that asset. Uh, as you already know by now, uh, the user never ends up on the same network as the application. Right? There's no IP address being assigned. So there's only layer seven access. What you see on the screen right now is the attacker is trying to run a simple GET request, which is using the log4j exploit string. So this string will, if, if the server is vulnerable, it will result in a connection going out to the attacker control machine. This is our external attacker control machine that I will show you shortly. The attacker machines are visible on the right side of the screen. So this is my internal log4j vulnerable application. Uh, it is behind ZPA. And what you see at the bottom of the screen is the attacker server. So this is the view the uh, attacker will see uh, when uh, the vulnerability exploit is successful, um, the attacker will also get a full remote shell access uh, that is visible over here. So I have a simple netcat listener uh, listening on port 999. So let's execute the attack. Um, um, I just fired off the exploit. As you can see on the right, um, at the top, the request was received. There were some exceptions, um, but uh, more importantly, the exploit string was received by the vulnerable internal application. Now, the vulnerable log4j library will interpolate uh, this string and make that JNDI lookup to the attacker control server, which you can see over here. Uh, the payload command over here is simply instructing the vulnerable system to make a netcat and provide remote shell uh, access to the attacker, right? This is the attacker machine. And I'm just serving the stage two payload that will allow me to execute that on the vulnerable server. So let's take a look at our netcat instance as well, uh, whether we were able to get full access or not. So I did receive the connection from the vulnerable server. I am now able to execute uh, arbitrary commands. I can look at all the stuff that is present on the file system of that vulnerable internal application because of the remote shell. Right? And uh, from this point onward, I could download arbitrary payloads and uh, perform additional activity on the server. Now, what we have done uh, as part of our recent innovation is we have added uh, inline inspection capability on Zscaler private access side as well. So let me actually show you guys how your team will be able to prevent and uh, add security controls uh, to safeguard against log 4 j like uh, zero-day exploit attempts. So I just logged into our admin panel for ZPA, 
Um, uh, I'll, I'll quickly show you the inspection uh, part of the product. So this is where there are thousands of predefined rules that will be available that are sourced through Threat Labs, which is our security research team. And then your team will also be able to write custom signatures, which is defined under this custom controls. And I have a custom control written for Apache Log4j over here. Uh, it is defined as allow, which is why my attack was successful. But let's go ahead and edit this one, right? So I'll show you what uh, what all things are configurable from your security standpoint. So you are able to define what headers you want to inspect. You are able to define size. Uh, this is the pattern that we have uh, embedded over here, right? So we're just simply looking for JNDI in this case and ending with that. And then you know, what type of uh, uh, action, policy action you want to take. So I'm going to change this to block and we're going to read on that exploit attempt uh, shortly. And then you're also able to define what severity this, uh, uh, if this alert were to trigger, what severity should your team respond to it with, right? So in this case, it's clearly a RCE should be critical and I'm going to save this. So now um, if I were to repeat the same exercise uh, that we just did, where you know we're able, we're, we're trying to exploit an internal application from a compromised system, um, I'm going to get a block page, right? I'm, um, the attacker won't be able to uh, successfully exploit the vulnerability. Uh, your team will also get visibility of this, right? So there will be an alert uh, that will get triggered as part of our web inspection flow. And so this is an exploit attempt getting triggered and you will be able to have full telemetry information around the request that happened, right? Uh, which control triggered, what were the different parameters used uh, so that your team is able to then take action. And right, so this is yet another security signal that your team gets on the ZPA side. The first one I mentioned was deception, where if someone inadvertently uh, hits uh, one of those decoys, you could orchestrate a response. Second is uh, our inline security inspection, where we will then um, block it and your team has uh, ability to orchestrate a response. Uh, the third piece is Zscaler cloud browser isolation, right? So a user that is deemed as risky because of uh, some of the activity that I just showed you, um, you will be able to have a policy that uh, says that when one of the risky user attempts to access a business critical application, I would want to isolate that session, right? And what that will allow you to do is the user will not be able to download any content on their system, right? So if I'm accessing an internal application from the compromised system, my, my access will be through an isolated instance. It's just stream of pixels uh, that will get delivered. And uh, uh, that essentially allows the organization to prevent, uh, prevent data exfiltration, right? Which is the last stage. So the user will not be able to dump large volumes of data from internal app to compromise system, and then uh, you know, exfiltrate it to an external attack surface, attacker control server. Uh, that brings me to the end of the live demo. Hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. Uh, thank you, everyone.